I'm Katrina Thurman. Um, Katrina Thurman is currently the Chief Operating Officer for Social Advocates for Youth, a Sonoma County nonprofit organization serving at risk youth ages 5 to 25. Katrina has a bachelor's degree in organizational communication and Russian from Arizona State and a master's degree in applied anthropology from the University of Maryland. She comes to us today with nearly 20 years of experience in nonprofit leadership. She has developed and led social service programs and teams in small rural communities and major metropolitan areas across the U.S. In her current role at SAY, she manages a budget of $5 million and leads a team of eight. Welcome, Katrina. So I've never done this before, I've never lectured. I've spoken in front of audiences of a couple thousand people, but you guys are far more intimidating. I'm not sure why that is. You all look like lovely, lovely people. Um, I read your chapter. How many of you have read the chapter? True. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, it was an interesting chapter about change. And as I was reading it and thinking about what could I give you from this you know, almost 20 years of experience that I have, running organizations trying to make change happen in communities, what could I tell you? So I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about me and why I do the work I do. And I do the work I do because I love making change. I love change. And it's kind of a bad word. It's a scary word. People are like, oh, change, change is hard. Change, I, don't want change. I don't want to change. I like things the way they are. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about change itself. It's nature. Why? It's... Uh, existence, its its role in what we do as humans every single day of our lives, every moment of our life is about change. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about what I do at SAY right now, at Social Advocates Read, about a really cool project that we're doing to make huge change in our community to help end homelessness for young people um, that don't have a place to be. So without further ado, we'll get started. So I'm going to start my story at approximately your age. So about 20 years ago, I just finished college, um, Arizona State, didn't know what I was going to do with my life, packed up my car, drove to Baltimore. I was in Arizona at the time. And accidentally, that's a different story, but accidentally found myself in the middle of the East Baltimore housing projects one night at a birthday party for a 43-year-old grandmother of six, crack cocaine addicted. Um, again, the story of how I got there is... Um, the newest of her grandbabies was just about a week old, was laying in his bassinet in the kitchen. The kitchen was steamy and hot, and it was summertime in Baltimore. Um, just all these smells and sounds are totally new to me. The newborn baby had a lit crack pipe about six inches from its face. And I sat there. You know, people talk about life-changing moments. In that moment, I actually picked my career. I'd already done my undergrad, but it was an organizational communication major. There was nothing you could do with that. That wasn't a doing. That was a lot of learning, and it was great, and I loved it. But I didn't know what I was going to do. And I realized that my life was going to be meaningless unless I intentionally went about making change. I wanted to make a change that was going to give that little baby any chance at all of making it alive out of projects. I, I realized my life's purpose right then was figuring out how to bring whatever I had in this brain to give. I wanted to share it in a way that it changed paths for children, that it, it made a difference, that it would bring the possibility of a different life to those who might not have it without some kind of intervention, without some kind of support. The people who live at the margins, the edges of society, need people to come and help it's not, oh, it's not that pull yourself up by your bootstraps, it's easy to do by yourself. They need support. I got a job at a nonprofit organization just a couple weeks after that experience in East Baltimore Projects. And I haven't changed professions. I haven't left since. I got a job literally as a receptionist. I said, I'll do it. I'll answer your phones. I don't care how I start. I'm going to start somewhere. And as you heard, I'm now the Chief Operating Officer for Social Advocates for Youth. It is the most fun I've ever had. So this is me. My boss is the furry dude in the middle. <laughs> um, his, name, his name is Matt. He has come, and I, I believe he's spoken to this class before. The lovely lady on the left is Kat, so there's Katrina, Matt, and Kat. Um, he's the executive director, she's our chief development officer, so he's the face of the organization. She raises the money, I spend all of it. 
So I get to spend about $5 million a year helping to make change. That's what I do for a living. Um, best job I've ever had. Every day in our county, what our staff does is identify children and their families who have fallen through the cracks. They're victims of violence, neglect, abuse, trauma, and we offer that helping hand. We offer the opportunity for change. I love seeing the smiling faces of kids who've benefited from our programs. There's nothing more rewarding in the world than even just that moment of change, that quick moment. Sorry guys, I feel like the podium is in the way. I'm like looking at you guys too. I'll keep like dancing around. Um, so I want to say something about change. Like change is actually, like it's a, it's a bad word, it's a hard word, people don't always like it. But when you see those faces and they come in sad and then they leave happy, it's worth it. It's worth the hard stuff we have to go through to get there. It turns out that change is a skill set. Being able to do it is actually a skill. And it's worth building up that muscle. Like it's, it's worth it, just like it's worth weightlifting because you want to lift something heavier than what you can do now. Building change muscles. Um, and we'll have a little exercise in it later. It's worth the time, it's worth your effort. I'm really grateful for that day 20 years ago. I'm honored by the work I get to do. And uh, I'm really grateful to be sharing with you today. So defining change. First one's pretty simple. Something made different. Second, a little bit more complicated, is to make the form, the nature, the content, the is of something, whatever it is now, different from what it is left it alone, to transform or convert, to substitute. What are some other synonyms? What do you think of? What's another word for change? I have, I have a list of 20 words that, that I've pulled. It's one of the easiest things to find a synonym for because it's kind of what life is. It's just change. What are some thoughts? Anybody? Adjust and adapt. Adjust, adapt, fabulous. Evolve. Evolve, yep. Mold, alter, shift. Quality. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, quality improvement instead of change. Innovate, modify, revolutionize. So revolutions are just great big changes, right? Remodel, temper, turn over, diversify, modulate, mutate, permutate. Our entire world is actually shaped around change. Okay, everybody stand up and change rows. Pick up all your stuff, move. You have to be in a different row. Do it as quickly as you can. Changed, didn't know where you were going or maybe why. It was unexpected. Unexpected, sudden. What else? How did that 
feel? What was that like? Actually, like your personal experience of it. Go ahead and tell me you're pissed, you're irritated, it was annoying, can't believe you did that to us. It was frustrating. Yeah, really frustrating. You had to you have to sit with somebody different. You split up the group of friends you were hanging out with, right? Your favorite. You were sitting next to your very favorite person, and now she's not your favorite, right? <laughs> <laughs> what else? How did that feel? Talk about your like experience. What that was like. Um, I didn't really bother me too much. I kind of just gave plan and like talked to them. Say it again. I just like made a game plan and talked to them. Oh, made a plan and immediately like came up with a plan in your head for how you were going to accomplish it. trying to figure out what was going on as you were doing it. You were discussing it with your peers. That's great. Go ahead. It's kind of a reflection of the change. Oh, so you're actually enjoying it. You enjoy yes. the result of the change. Maybe not getting there, but it's good now that you're there. Great. So what I just did is something that you should not do. Suddenly, take, step, tell a room full of strangers that you have no relatedness with you. You guys don't like me yet, you don't know me, and I just suddenly bark an order out to you that's a change from what you were comfortable with, what you were doing, what was working for you. So change management actually doesn't start with what I just did. Um, so what could have made it easier? What would have made that experience better for you? What could I have done differently? Anybody? Clearer instructions, for sure. Maybe inquire first as to how you selected that particular seat. And maybe you had a really great reason for that particular one. And maybe I shouldn't make you move or change. Go ahead. Explain the purpose of why it was actually in the first place. Explain why. That would have kind of ruined the whole exercise. But, yes, that would have been bad. A little advanced warning, you could have had your bag all packed and ready to go so that you could hop that seat over. What else? What else could I have done differently? Is there any other way you could have supported each other in the change? Maybe easier to close the room It was a little chaotic for a moment. If somebody had yelled fire, if there might have been an accident on the stairs trying to get out. Okay. So I just wanted to, that was, Annoying, I apologize. But the point of it is, in, in change leadership, the most important thing you can do is not have people left with that experience. So whether you're just driving a car and you decide suddenly that you're going to exit sooner than what your passenger thought you were going to do, you might want to say out loud, hey, you know what, I, just, I realize I'm hungry, I'm going to get off now. Even for that passenger in your car, it's going to make them feel better that you just made a change in the plans. All the way to huge changes where you give people advance warning. Change is the most fundamental, natural thing in the world. In fact, it's, it's this fundamental fact that makes our world what it is. Every cell, every moment, even the ones that appear stationary are actually changing. Everything is just energy in motion, changing, changing, changing constantly. If you look at every single field of study that, that humans have gotten into, is our attempt to understand, control, Try to manipulate the pace or the outcome of change, the inevitability of change. That's what science is, That's what religion is. Engineering is to try to overcome change using structures. Science develops hypotheses about why things change the way they change so that we can understand better, so that we can try to control more of the outcomes of change. It's completely inevitable that impermanence is the essential characteristic of all of our life. And yet it's this thing we really so greatly and fear. That's natural. It makes sense that we would do that. It makes sense that we would do that. As humans, the more control we have over our society, our world, the next thing that's going to happen, the more likely we are not to die, right? So this is evolutionary. This is basic, you know, we're going to succeed as a species. The more control we have over this inevitability, so this quote that's up here, um, I'd actually like to read it to you if you don't mind indulging me, just kind of just close your eyes, you don't necessarily need to read along. 
We cannot say of anything, animate or inanimate, organic or inorganic. This is lasting. It's not a single thing. For even while we are saying this, it would be undergoing change. All is fleeting, the beauty of the flowers, the bird's melody, the bees hum, and the sunset's glory. So, with that in place, what's the next thing we'd want to do as humans? We'd want to build up some muscle for dealing with change. So in your textbook, page 411, I think it was, yeah, um, the author talks about resilience. And this is something that you help a three-year-old develop. It turns out it's something you help a 30-year-old develop when you work with them, or a 50-year-old or an 80-year-old. So resilience in life, that muscle, the change muscle, is the capacity to absorb high levels of change while displaying minimal dysfunctional behavior. So at three, that looks like helping the three-year-old learn the coping skills that when they don't get the thing they wanted, that life changed on them, that they're not on the floor throwing a temper tantrum. But it turns out that adults, you guys might have even experienced it in yourself a little bit, you had a little bit of a desire to display some dysfunctional behavior that minute ago when I made you move. Just because it sucked. It wasn't fun, you didn't want to. Why should my kids do this? And that experience happens at all ages, for all people, always. You might end up going, oh, okay, well that turned out better than I thought it was going to be. So at the end, it might turn out okay. But finding that capacity to hold change in a way that you don't out loud throw your temper tantrum about it, that's a muscle, it, and it's worth practicing. So, change is inevitable and fundamental. It's also magical and powerful. Every management book, every leadership book, ultimately is about change in some way. They don't, they don't all have the title, change management, change leadership, but they're all about how to do it. They're all about how to make a change, how to, make, how to do it better, faster, easier, how to make people happier about it. There's an ingredient that isn't often called out, as it is the magic ingredient, in my opinion. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but just be thinking about what that one magical ingredient might be to have change work at its highest capacity for good. We're going to take a short moment for a cheesy little video about change. Just bear with it until the end. The end is actually the point um, that we're going to carry through. It doesn't matter, it's just that what's on the screen.
consider your passengers. It's all about the passengers. And the heart's there because I think that's the secret ingredient. It's actually about loving your passengers. So it's about allowing them to have control over whether their windows crack a little bit along the way. It's about telling them that you're about to exit. It's about warning them that you're actually going to get off in about 20 minutes. It's about dual climate control. It's about allowing and asking and requesting input, explaining why change is happening. It's about loving your passengers. If you're the one leading the change, you are in by far the most comfortable seat in the house. You're the one in control of it. The person who is the passenger is, or the passengers are the most uncomfortable. So if you think of it, if you treat, if you're trying to just make a small change in your life and there's some project you're leading, think of them as your, as your guests in your vehicle. Just think of, and if, you, and if you think of them that way, what would you say to them differently? Maybe then, just, I, I'm the one driving, I'm in charge, I'm in control. What, would you, what might you do differently? How would you engage them in the change process? How would you ask them questions? It's really about loving. And I, the word love does not get used enough in business, in my opinion, um, because really, love, relatedness, respect, they're all the same thing. They, they, it gets manifest in all these different ways, and it's about listening and caring and understanding and valuing. It's all love. It's all the same thing. Um, the more that you're willing to say it and use it, it's pretty bold, but it actually really works because it turns out that all humans kind of like to be loved and cared about. So it actually works really well as a strategy. I'm going to shift to a very specific project that SAY is doing right now that is a huge change in our community because we found a problem that we want to do something about. We did a homeless count in 2013 and found 1,128 12- to 24-year-old young people were homeless in Sonoma County. That's the highest per capita of homeless youth in the entire country. So we said, wow, we need to make a change. We need to end homelessness for youth. Sounds simple. It's not simple. Turns out people are even resistant. People are like, well, no, what are we going to have to do to make that change? So we actually... Um, started the change management process. And um, the Harvard professor that's referenced in your text, Cotter, that eight-stage process for creating major changes <coughs> is kind of the way to do it. It actually works really well, so I'm going to take you through what we've done. The first thing you have to do is create a sense of urgency about whatever the problem is, whatever it is you're trying to solve, create a sense of urgency, get the facts, really communicate the facts, dive into them, make them rich and juicy. So in 2009, there were 268 kids when we 2011, it went up to 701. Oh my God, it's terrible. 2013, when the numbers came back and it was 1,128, suddenly it was unacceptable. And that sense of urgency had to increase now. And we took that kind of passion, that kind of fire, and that kind of drive, and we went out into the community with it. And we built the guiding team. So the way that you build the guiding team is you find your friends, you find the people that, that support it, that are good advocates, that helped found whatever the project was in the beginning, the people who are already natural leaders that may not know that there's 1,128 homeless kids sleeping outside tonight on the freezing cold night in winter, but you go and you talk to those community leaders and you tell them about it. And you say, would you like to be part of this guiding team? These people need to be powerful folks. They need to be powerful in whatever way. Power is not necessarily out loud. They can be powerful in lots of different ways. They need to make sure you're clear on what your vision is. Where are you going? What is it going to look like when it's done? So we went out and we listened a lot. We went to places all over the country that have done similar work to try to end homelessness for youth in their communities. We looked at youth centers all over the country. We thought we had it right at one point. It turns out we didn't. We were wrong. We said that out loud. So it's okay as a leader to acknowledge that you didn't get it right the first time. And you started, like, okay, we think it's, it should be like this. Mm. Nope. Turns out that that really isn't the best way of doing it. Some more into ideas. We listened some more. We got the vision right. The vision for ending youth homelessness here in Sonoma County starts with the SAY Dream Center. How many of you have heard of the project that SAY is doing in Denny Valley right now, the Dream Center? It's a couple of you. So Sutter Hospital had this hospital building, Sutter Memorial, had this hospital building that hadn't been used since 2007. It was sitting there empty with 63 beds in it, just sitting there. And there's a over a thousand homeless kids, 63 empty beds, a thousand homeless kids. 
It seems like the beginning of a good solution. And so we took on this project. This was almost two and a half years ago now. And we said, we're going to build a dream center for you. We're going to build a place where homeless youth can come and get services and get jobs, get stably housed, get some good um, mental health care if that's what they need, get access to other services. We're going to build a dream center. And that'll be the starting point for ending youth homelessness in Sonoma. 63 beds phased in over time, affordable. Many of the units, there won't be any rent paid at all. The, the highest paid rent would be one third of their income, whatever that income happens to be. So in order to get there, to build 63 beds, to remodel a hospital, you need lots of money. It turns out you need about $9 million. Um, so you need to start communicating a lot to get buy into the community with that. You, you don't just like snap your fingers and have $8 million, $9 million show up. So we went to Rotary meetings and Chambers of Commerce and the JC and task forces and churches. And we went everywhere we could go and kept telling this, show, sharing this vision, sharing the message, getting the buy-in, getting the support. But we realized it was another error. So admitting, admitting mistakes always a good thing. Our executive director, Amy Pat and I, crazy trio, said, you know what? We need to really make sure that our entire organization, our board and staff, our 80 staff and our 25 board members, that we all share the same core values that we're doing this with, that we're coming at it together. And so we polled all of them. We came up with, we said, who is SAY? Who is SAY? Who are we as an organization? And about 55, 60 different kind of answers came back. It turns out they all fell into these seven categories. We love people. We're there for youth when they need it the most. We are in this work together. We are not doing this alone. We're youthful. I don't happen to be the youthful one in lunch. I think when they do like a little in the hallways, it's silly. But yeah, some of us are youthful. We're our best selves. We bring our best self to work. Even if we're grumpy that day, we're going to be the best version of grumpy we can possibly be. We're committed to that. Because we're committed to service. And we're bold. We're going to end youth homelessness. That's a bold statement. But because we're doing it together, we think it's possible. So then the next thing to do is empower action out in the community. So we got clear on our core values. Then we needed to inspire some others. We had 200 people show up two, the last two winters in a row for the Dream Walk. The Dream Walk was an opportunity to walk around on a freezing cold, rainy night. An opportunity. Wouldn't this be something you choose to do on a Friday night for fun? Holding a little candle, walking around, and walking the path of a youth in downtown Santa Rosa, just pretending for one night that you didn't get to go home to a warm bed, that you weren't going to have um, any place to dry your clothes after you got soaking wet. We had 200 people show up, and then we shared, we got the message out to them, and then we had the other 200 that said, I'm so sorry I couldn't come, but give me more information about that. I want, I want to learn more. So we had a lot of little short-term wins that needed to be celebrated, so we needed to create opportunities, because we're not going to end youth homelessness this year, we're not going to probably end it in five years. But if we're all going in that direction, along the way we need to have opportunities to succeed and to celebrate that. So we have community dinners, we do tours, we talk about it, we thank constantly. There's a lot of gratitude that goes into leading change. Gratitude for even taking that one step in the right direction. Never let up. There's a persistence, a tenacity that's required make change, particularly bold ones, and particularly when it turns out you have some grumpy neighbors that don't want you to put formerly homeless kids in their neighborhood. And you have to deal with that over and over and over again. You have to sit in front of people who say, but those kids, I don't want them near my kids that are the good ones. You have to sit there. And just like you love the people that are in the vehicle with you, right? You love your passengers, you love the people that have gotten on your bus that are like, yeah, we're ending youth homelessness. It turns out that, that loving the people that are throwing the eggs at your bus is actually also really effective. So we sat down in living rooms. We had more coffee and tea and glasses of wine and terrible cookies in people's living rooms over the course of two years than anybody could have imagined probably ever doing or consuming. Just to, for the person that was sitting there criticizing the kids that we wanted to help. But we sat there with them and we loved them. We listened to their perspective. We listened to why they didn't want the change we were and all but two of them, literally, all but two, signed on as supporters of the project by the time we were done with that effort. The two that didn't filed a lawsuit. So, uh, 
we're still fighting that. Um, and, uh, and believe me, even my, my boss has more tenacity even than I do. Um, he still calls the gentleman who's filed, who's filed the lawsuit and who hasn't let it go. He calls him once a month just to say hi, say, are there any other questions I can answer for you? Is there anything else that I can do that would help you understand this project and who we are and what we're committed to better than you do right now? Is there anything else I can do? The guy usually hangs up on him. And Matt takes a deep breath and says, okay, I'll try again next month. That's change management on, on a hard day. Like that, that's not fun stuff. Making change stick, that takes something more than just math. So I just referenced my boss. It actually takes a whole team of leaders who are learning that kind of tenacity and capacity. We have a lot of momentum. We've raised eight million of the nine million it's going to take to raised eight million faster than any nonprofit has ever raised eight million dollars for a capital campaign. We did it because we followed steps one through six. We had an amazing team of people and 50, 60, 70 people all spreading the word until there were 200 at a dream walk, which really would have been 400 if the other 200 hadn't been like home with their kids because it was a really freezing cold rainy night. We built a community movement. This change isn't about one person. You need to be training the next driver of your bus in whatever the topic is. Train the next one, train the next one, train them all. Say, anybody else want a chance to drive the bus next time? Great. Then start planning the next trip. So let's say you're, so you're, our bus's destination is ending in homelessness. The first stop happens to be the Dream Center getting built. So we should open the Dream Center about January is when I think I'll be able to move all of my staff over and start opening the beds. We're already talking about what we're doing next. So the next thing we're gonna do is we need to go find more apartments in the community where the apartment owner is willing to rent to young people that we're supporting. Then the next thing that we're gonna do is we need to build another homeless shelter that targets younger folks because it's really scary to go to an adult homeless shelter. And so 18 to 25 year olds don't go there. And then they become victims of sexual predators on the streets, far more than any other homeless population. So we're talking about that. We're already designing what stops two, three, four, and five are and we're designing that Matt might, might not be the one leading the bus. So to make change stick, we need to also talk about what's the past the vision. Like I'm making this change now, but here's the next thing that we would like to do. What do you think about that? Do you want to be part of that? Do you want to stay on the bus? Do you want to get off and like repack your bag from the sweaters and the jackets and go get a bikini that we're going to buy? Do you want to make that change with us? And it's working. It's working at the city level, the county level, ultimately the state and the federal level. is a great quote. Management is about coping with complexity. So a lot of what I do every day is actually management. I have complexity. Managing five million dollars across 40 contracts and 80 people and there's a lot of complexity and that's a lot of details. Um, and it's fun. Some people are good at that, some people don't like it. Different skill sets. Paired with managing that complexity, leading it's about coping with change. It's about coping with it with the most resilient nature you can possibly have. Throwing as few tantrums as possible, essentially. Helping those around you when they do throw a tantrum. Just put your hand on their back. Okay, they're there. I get it. It's kind of sucks right now. But it'll get better. Let's let's keep let's stay on this bus. Let's keep this process moving. So I'm gonna talk about love. They really admire. Like that you really you've done some research and do you have a company that comes to mind immediately? Is a company you admire? You'd love to go work there. Lockheed Martin, great organization. What are a few others? Hmm? Verity. It's a great nonprofit organization. Google. Google. Google is a fabulous, fabulous company. REI. REI. Huckleberry Youth Programs. Haven't heard of them, but I'm sure they're wonderful. Go ahead. Love. Love. Very good. So, whether they say out loud, we love our staff, we love our people, 
we love our product, whether they use the word love or they use a different word, I can virtually guarantee that any company that you have that kind of affinity for naturally has love in the workplace. They change from a perspective of love. When they implement new policies that are going to impact staff, they think about, they truly think about, care about, deeply care about, how is this going to impact the work around us? How will, if I change this policy that adds a sick day or reduces sick leave or increases vacation or changes how we compensate people, they care deeply about the impact that that's going to have. That's love. That, that's what love is. And the bold ones actually use the word in the workplace. Um, great leaders, they're inspiring because they leave you engaged on an emotional level. They're not, it's not just your brain that's happy when you feel inspired to an action, but there's actually an emotion attached to that. It's okay to use the word. I think if I could leave you with nothing else, but two things. Change is all that life is. Change, it's, it's, that's it. Every moment, every second passes, that's all it is. If you think that something's not changing, that's an illusion. It actually is, it's just changing so slowly you can't see it right now. Or it's about to. Love is actually the most powerful tool that if you remembered nothing else about what to do when change gets hard, love the person sitting in front of you. Have compassion for them, show that kind of care. Show, because that's what matters at the end of the day. Human beings are doing nothing building that resilient muscle for dealing with this ever-changing world. And coming from a place of love, showing love, care, and great compassion for that fact, for that very essential core fundamental fact of life, is the best place you can come from as a leader. You guys have questions? I would love to answer questions if we have time. How much time do we have? love to tell you any other stories if you have questions about anything either that SAY is doing or my career if you're interested in nonprofit stuff I'd be happy to answer that for you as well. <coughs> One second to tell you a quick story. So Social Advocates for Youth was founded by a group of attorneys locally who said 44 years ago, it is not okay that we arrest kids who run away from home because they chose that the street was safer than their bedroom. It used to be illegal to run away from home, in case anybody doesn't know that. It, it's not illegal anymore. So it was illegal to run away from home. It was illegal. You were picked up, you were arrested as a juvenile delinquent for running away from your home, regardless of the conditions in your bedroom or in your home. And a group of attorneys locally said that is not okay. And a group of organizations up and down the state all called social advocates for youth, went to the federal level and advocated for a change in the federal level law that created the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act that said nowhere in the country is it okay to make it illegal for a kid to escape their home. Um, when was that established? 1974 was the establishment of the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. You can still call the police, but it's not illegal anymore. You are not arrested. You're actually brought to us. Sorry. You're brought to Social Advocates for Youth, where we have a teen shelter that's designed to be the safe place to be if home isn't where you want to be or should be right now. Um, how did you get, um, you know that one night you said that you called your grandmother? How did you get there? It's not a super personal story. I had a crush on a boy. It turns out he was a drug dealer. I didn't know that at the time. I really didn't. I was, I, if you think I look naive now, imagine me at 20 years old. So, seriously, as naive as I could possibly be. And I thought this guy was really cute. And he said, I'm going to a party. I said, great. Got in the car. We went down. I'm like, where are we going? He said, oh, to a friend's house. It's a birthday party. You'll love it. He drops me off at this birthday party for the 43-year-old crack cocaine addicted grandmother and leaves. It turns out to go deal, but just leaves. There were not cell phones 20 years ago that were, I didn't have one at least, there 
happened before, but I didn't have one. And I didn't know when he was coming back. I didn't know where I was. I'd arrived in Baltimore five days earlier. So I got to spend the rest of the evening, it turned until about two in the morning, at the birthday party. It was a fabulous life experience. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was amazing. I wouldn't change it for anything. It, it built a heart and a compassion in me, and a love and a caring, and a great desire to help the kids that I saw there. Thank you guys.